Yeah, and yeah, I'm, on this topic, I'm curious your take. It seems that there's an evolution in, and and I correct my terminology here, but a, a, like a bilateral movement versus unilateral, t- two feet versus one foot or staggered. Is that is that the right terminology? Uh, you're close. It depends on how pedantic you want to be here. Okay. So tip, technically, bilateral is two feet of support. Unilateral is one limb of support. So things like a split squat or a lunge are not unilateral. Okay. Got it. But it's a, it's a different... Feet. But a step up would be unilateral. Got it. And it seems... I call it, a lunge a lot of times unilateral because it's... So whatever. You get got the- you. But you see what I'm getting at. And, and it seems like, you know, maybe there's some evolution and people realizing, okay... How often are you in a back squat position in sport? You know what I mean? Maybe, I mean, every once in a while, if, if you're hitting a full back in the hole that, you know, in that, that millisecond where you square up and you, okay, you might be in, in a, in a back squat type position, but then you're going to, you know, you're going to drive your hands through them and okay. For a millisecond there was, but 99% of other scenarios, you're never in that position. So why are we training that the only movement uh, so I'm just curious, has that, I'm guessing with your athletes, you're doing a lot more unilateral stuff in it. No. Okay. Well then here we go. This would be a good debate. You, you've entered a 30 year old strength conditioning argument. This is, this has been argued for a very long time. Uh, look back at Mike Boyle, right? So I have seen the world differently than Mike and many things, but he's been an enormous positive influence on the field. He is for 30 years been arguing unilateral for all those reasons you mentioned, right? Um, you do that. We actually published a paper, myself and Ramsey Ninjam. Ramsey was our former master student. He's now the head strength conditioning coach uh, for University of Kansas basketball program. He's gone on to do wonderful things. We published a paper on unilateral versus bilateral probably a decade ago now or more. So you want to be really careful. Both are good. Full stop. Both are very, very, very good. What we're talking about now is the next layer down. Because you can't make an argument that neither one is good. That's very, very clear. The next layer down, though, is you have to be really careful with specificity, with function. When people throw these words out, they mean nothing, right? And when you say, oh, this is this movement's more functional. This one's more sport-specific. Simply because it looks visually more like your sport does not make it more specific or more functional. It doesn't even make it more useful, okay? So... The, the basic drawback is this. If you take anything away from stability, so this means a split stance, a unilateral position, you could be on a rear foot or front foot elevated. You could be on an unstable surface like a ball or something like that. It's going to be more realistic to a on-field scenario, correct? Sure. However, you're automatically reducing force and power production. You can't, you simply cannot produce the same amount of force when you go on an unstable situation. And so what you're doing is you're training and you're teaching yourself to produce less force, less power production. You're not actually peaking that skill or that tactic out. And so if you were to compare the bilateral versus unilateral deficit is what they call it. So think about it this way. Uh, If you can leg press with one leg, 500 pounds, and then your left leg is 500 pounds and your right leg is 500 pounds. If you put both legs on at a time, do you produce 1,200 or you produce 800 or do you produce 1,000? If you produce less than 1,000, that is called a bilateral deficit. So your force production goes into a deficit when you go bilateral. If you produce the the more than that, 1,200 pounds or 1,100, right? You've got a bilateral overshoot. Okay. Now, the reality of it is both of those scenarios happen in real life. Generally, people that are untrained or lowly trained will have a bilateral deficit. So you will actually produce more force per leg by training unilateral. So the unilateral adder could say, hey, if I do a bilateral leg press, and I'm choosing a leg press here so we can take technique and stuff out of it because a single leg squat is never going to be equivalent to a bilateral squat. Like you can't. So unilateral advocates will say, hey, if I do the unilateral version of it, I'm actually getting more force production out of that leg than when I did the bilateral version. Because when I put the bilateral on, I only get 800 pounds. Therefore, there's only 400 on my left, 400 on my right. The reality of it is once you become trained, that deficit almost always goes away. And in fact, there is a general compensation. Look at power lifters. Power lifters can squat 1,000 pounds. Not a single one of them can do a 500-pound single leg squat. Not even close. There is a massive increase in bilateral efficiency when you go there. 
And so what it comes down to is you, again, understanding your person. Are we talking about a low level, kind of moderate level, untrained person? Then maybe unilateral is a little bit of a thing. Higher level strength, then maybe that thing goes away. At some point, you can't put, you know, somebody who's really strong can for sure leg press 1,500 pounds. That's not even crazy. Like well over 2,000 pounds can be done. So then you're going to be doing what, single leg leg presses at 1,200 pounds? Okay, so at some point, like the mass just matters here. And again, the exercises don't equate. So you, you can't simply do, um, RDL tends to be okay. A single leg RDL is a reasonable one, but again, a squat is not, it's not really equivalent. We're not talking the same exercise. A one leg, a deadlift. Now you're basically just doing an RDL. So like, it doesn't really matter. A bench press is the closest one. So a, a bilateral bench press versus a single arm is really easy to exchange over, okay? So that is there. But the, again, the big caveat here is just because it doesn't look like it or smell like it or sound like it doesn't mean it's more functional. The last little argument you can make here is if I, if you want to go train unilateral and you're doing all your unilateral RDLs and you're doing 65 pounds on them and my athlete's doing a bilateral RDL with 300 pounds on it, I will be willing to bet when we get into single leg situations, my athlete is going to dominate because the force actually produced over the whole system is significantly higher. Now, I, I, I kind of strong man you there, like I, I, I straw man you there, but you get the point here. So at some point, there's like, okay, great. You can go more sports specific, more functional. But if you do that thing too far, then you forget about actual producing horsepower. So you can't go fast. You can't go heavy. You can't produce a lot of force into those situations. So there's a strong argument to wrap this up for both. I absolutely fundamentally use bilateral and unilateral in every program, basically. But you wouldn't want to make an argument that one is just absolutely categorically better than the other one for all those reasons. So I'm not sure that's what you were thinking you were getting into with that comment, but you no, no, I love it. it. I mean, you. it's a great explanation. And and that's kind of what I was doing. And and honestly, I had always been very traditional with like mainly, mainly yeah. bilateral in, in college. We did some unilateral stuff, but it was hang cleans and back squats and, um, you know, things like that, you know, it, that you typically would see. Um, and then I actually, my, this, that same strength coach named Emil Johnson, he sent me a program recently, uh, because on this podcast, he learned that I didn't have a program and I was just winging it. So he texted me immediately. was like, all right, I'm getting your ass on a program. And yeah. it was, it, it had evolved since the days when I was, uh, you know, when he was yeah. coaching me, um, and there was some stuff like you're, you know, you have a leg up on a bench and then you're up on yep. your toe, you know what I mean? Uh, which I had never done kind of on the toes. And then you had to do a you know, part of it for three weeks. I think it was a five second eccentric, you know, yeah. lower brutal one leg. You know, I had yeah. like 135 pounds on it was destroying me. Um, and then you try to it's explode up and then the eccentric changed, you know, in the next three weeks. And it was with paired with single leg box jumps and all these things. And after 12 weeks, I actually felt, I felt super athletic again. Like at my, my explosive power doing box jumps with when it became a bilateral box jump, I feel like I could jump through the roof um, so it was like, man, that just exposing me to that because, you know, since college, I just been doing back squat and deadlifts and just real normal, you know, vanilla stuff. Um, so you're, yeah. you're basically saying incorporating both is, is the best way to do it. Yeah. What you're going to see is, so back in my day, everybody for the most part in strength conditioning did what you did. And I was the same way. I'm like, I'm benching, I'm squatting, like cleaning, snatching, like the rest of the stuff is garbage. Right. And then you'll go on the football field or the tennis court or the pitch or whatever. And that's how you be, be more athletic, right? Okay, fine. I think the field was heads too far in that direction. And then you have, you know, again, I'll just call it the Mike Boyles who went literally the opposite direction. And that is great because I don't think that that was true, but it pulled the field more towards the center line, right? It wasn't center. It's not 50, 50, but it's not zero. Like I would have told you, 20 years ago. And like most of our strength conditioning coaches, sounds like you're a strength conditioning. That was the norm, right? You're just like, we're not doing any of that foo-foo shit. Like that's not what we're doing, right? We're, we're squatting and stuff like that. Okay, great. So I think what you're going to see is most people, if you go around the, the NFL strength coaches, the major league baseball strength coaches, the, the whatever ones, like the power five ones, they're going to look probably more like that. We're going to still focus on the big stuff even throughout the season. But then we'll have phases of the season. We'll have phases of our workout. Within the workout, we're going to do more things like that. Why? We want to work on transferring force from that big toe to your left shoulder. And that it's instead of just saying, okay, great, we're going to get all stable. We're going to push through our heels and pull up. We need to work on human movement. 
And we can do that in a bunch of different ways. So your uh, rear foot elevated split squat, any, <laughs> any of the athletes I coach are probably chuckling right now because I love that exercise. Not necessarily always for a, um, uh, for a, a, a slow movement like that, but you can, but we do that a ton, right? The, the upside of doing unilateral things is it allows greater range of motion while keeping the spine neutral. So if you have a hard time front squatting or back squatting to really, to great depth and good position, well, now you can actually probably do that in a rear foot elevated position. You put your foot up on a toe like that, and now you're getting a great range of motion through the front side and the back side. So you can become much more dynamic much more flexible. You can get your range of motion flexibility training done while you're lifting rather than having to sit there and stretch afterwards. So the benefit of unilateral is, of course, the stability, but it's really the transfer of force from contralateral limbs to actually upper and lower, inferior and superior ones as well, as now we can get much greater range of motions in safer positions. So there's a huge argument for it. And I would, I would again, say most of the really intelligent coaches, even if you start getting into like a the, the, the CrossFit level coaches, you're going to have some components of those because you, you will hear that renown. You I felt more athletic, felt more opened up. Well, you, you get, you got a better range of motion. You opened up your hips more, your hips aren't as tight anymore. Your shoulders aren't as tight anymore. You open things up, you moved rotationally in different planes of motion and things don't, ah, oh, you feel better because you just open things up and you just use weights to do it instead of the old days when you just laid in the floor and stretched as your only method of, of moving in a different plane. So yeah, I, I think that's what you'd say most of the good folks now are, are doing some combination of these movements. 